Randy, are you ready? I'm ready. All right. Ready. I'll turn it over to you then. All right. Thank you. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. All right. Well, I'm Randy Shields. Uh, thanks for inviting me to talk today. Uh, that's one thing I really love to do is talk. Randy, yes. Yeah. Can you take like one step back? Uh-huh. Oh, so you can see. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Got it. Okay, very good. Thank you. So a little bit about me. Uh, I've been around airplanes my whole life. Uh, the upper uh, left photo there is me as a youngster with one of my dad's radio control airplanes. Uh, fortunately, he decided to start learning to fly when I was about 13, and we had a rocket chief that I soloed in when I got to be 16. He uh, sold that and bought a Stinson Voyager, which uh, you can see up in the upper left, uh, which... Uh, Includes a picture of my future wife at the time. You know, I had to take her flying to make sure that she would be uh, worthy, right? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, I've been in uh, engineering my whole career. I graduated from Purdue with an uh, uh, aeronautical engineering degree. Uh, married for almost 40 years. Uh, I've got my uh, instrument, my commercial flight instructor. Uh, the uh, thing I don't have, though, is an a &P license yet I've restored an airplane. So I want to make sure you appreciate today that you, know, you don't have to be a licensed mechanic uh, to get this stuff done, but you have to work with a licensed mechanic, and especially if he's got an inspection authorization, it really works well. Uh, and when you talk about restoring an airplane, you, obviously there's various levels you can go to. And as you'll see as I go through the presentation today, uh, I took this about as deep as you could go probably. So the question might be, you know, why pick a Stinson? Well, obviously, uh, you know, there had been one in my previous uh, life uh, back when I was in uh, high school and college. So a lot of nostalgia there. Uh, as we just heard in the last presentation, there's a lot of them were built and a lot of them are still out there. Uh, I think one advantage you have with a Stinson is that Univair holds the TC and they'll make about any part you need for price. And, and we've all experienced that probably. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but you know it's really nice. You know, where else can you have something that's you know 70 plus years old and be able to get a replacement part uh, with just a call? So that's really a big deal. That's a very safe airplane. Uh, there's actually uh, no airframe ADs on the airplane, and of course Stinson tried to make it stall proof. And as you probably know, the you know flaps uh, deflect more as you have, um, or the up elevator is greater as you put more flap on. And they also have the leading edge slats uh, to try to help with that. Uh, in my mind, the Achilles heel of the whole design is the Franklin engine. And uh, as you'll see as I go through this, I decided to abandon the Franklin and go with a Lycoming 180. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, the picture there is uh, me and my dad in uh, 1975 up at Oshkosh, uh, camping out next to the airplane there. Uh, so I found this airplane on Barnstormers. I don't know if you're like me, but uh, you know that's my daily uh, religion is to check uh, the antique classic section of Barnstormers, see what's out there. And um, I just happened to be looking, and, and I found this Stinson, and it was on the west side of Wichita. And I thought, well, hey, that's kind of local. I ought to at least go take a look, right? And uh, you know, I convinced my wife eventually that this was the right thing to do. And uh, it was in pieces. Uh, the wings were located in a storage area, a storage unit in Andover, and the, uh, the fuselage was in the guy's backyard. And I didn't find this one picture, uh, the one that looks like it's in the rainforest there, until long after I owned the airplane. Uh, but that explained a lot of things. You know, I was kind of told that this had been in a barn for the last 40 years, you know, other, other things like that. So brought it home and then uh, started taking the fabric off. and. Uh, there's uh, more of the fabric off. And if, if we take a look here, so this is December 8th of 2007 when I started. So, you know, by uh, uh, December 21st, I had quite a bit of the, uh, the fuselage uh, stripped, but uh, I wasn't done yet. So then I uh, you know, rented an engine stand and took off the engine. And the one thing about the engine, uh, it was missing uh, like the number five jug. And so you could uh, look into the inside of the engine and of course there was leaves hanging out of it and, and other stuff. So I was pretty sure that engine was toast. And I was going to have to do something new. Uh, so continue to take stuff off the airplane. You know, but 
the one thing I found uh, that was really interesting about the restoration process is the people that you meet along the way. And uh, Wade is one of the people I met. Turns out we're from the same hometown back in Indiana. And we didn't know that at the time. Uh, I joined the International Stinson Club. And you know, when you join, they always uh, publish in the newsletter, here's our new members and contact information. And so I got a note from him, said, hey, neighbor, you know, and because uh, he was also from Wichita. And we started corresponding back and forth. And pretty soon we realized that uh, we were from the same hometown. We had both gone to Purdue. Uh, and he has a uh, A&P and an IA. I thought, well, hey, this is who I've been looking for. And so we kind of made a deal. And, and you can see his airplane in the background there that he was restoring. Um, and we decided that uh, I would teach him how to fly because he was restoring an airplane but doesn't have a pilot's license. And, and he would be my IA. And so uh, that was uh, a great friendship that started. And uh, another person along the way, uh, this is my friend Jim, uh, it turned out that uh, part of the airplane wasn't with the airplane. You know, when I bought the airplane, uh, it was missing the cowlings, uh, the struts, uh, and some other things. And so uh, Jim drove up to uh, Marion, Iowa to pick up the rest of the parts and, and hand over more money uh, on my behalf uh, for those. And so eventually, uh, by uh, March of that year, I had the whole airplane. It was interesting, uh, Paul Swearingen uh, had owned the airplane back in the late 70s. And uh, he bought it in like 78, and in 79 it had engine failure. And so it kind of got parked. And then uh, his wife got sick and, and life went on and, and he kind of abandoned the airplane eventually. And wings got taken off and it just kind of got stored. But for some reason he had some of the parts in his garage, uh, like the cowlings and the struts. And so those moved with him to Iowa when he moved up there. And he always thought, one of these days, somebody's going to get a hold of me and say, hey, do you have any of these parts? And so when I finally got a hold of him, you know, he wasn't surprised that uh, I tracked him down. He was actually quite pleased. And so anyway, I got the rest of the parts. And we started uh, you know, sandblasting the fuselage to see how things looked. As you probably know, on a lot of these tail draggers, uh, corrosion in the tail is, is a real concern. Because uh, you know it's, that's a low point in the fuselage, and as you saw in the earlier picture, mine sat outside a lot, and so all that rain and stuff kind of went back there. You know, the other thing about the fuselage was uh, it was uh, basically a mouse house for a long time, and uh, they had eaten almost anything you could find, and and so when I was stripping the fabric off the airplane and everything else, you know, I had on. Uh, the gloves, the mask, you name it, because uh, you don't know, you know what you're dealing with there sometimes. But uh, uh, anyway, you can see some pictures here. We kind of found uh, a lot of corrosion as we started sandblasting it. Kind of looks like a piccolo tube there. And uh, Hector Camacho, if you uh, are from the Wichita area, you might recognize that name. Uh, he uh, uh, let me use his sandblasting equipment to, uh, to do this. So this is April, so we're kind of about you know five months into the process here. Those are all the way through. Yes, yeah, yeah. Those are all the way through. Yeah, we're gonna have to work on that. Now the other thing that was kind of weird was there's this big gap in the logbook, like it had last flown in 1965, and then in 1978 it starts flying again, and the entry in the logbook basically says aircraft completely recovered. And, and yeah, and that was about it. But it's like, well, what, what went on for all that time, you know? Well, turns out, as you can see in the lower picture here, that the airplane uh, flipped over in a windstorm out in uh, the New York area. And it just happened to land on top of some telephone poles that were stacked there and, and other things. They had it tied down really well. And then the, the line guys decided that they needed to move it. And where they moved it to, there wasn't any tie down. So they just hung a couple of concrete blocks off of each uh, rope. You know, obviously not enough. You know, if that wing is capable of lifting 2,400 pounds, uh, it's uh, going to do uh, more than that. So anyway, that kind of filled in uh, some gaps. And, and Alf Folsom uh, was the owner back in that time period. Sold it to the insurance company. It went through a few hands before it, it finally ended up uh, getting restored. Uh, so another key guy I met along the way, because now I had to go find somebody who knew how to do aircraft welding. 
And um, that was uh, a guy named Mark Wiebe. The Wiebe family in the Wichita area is really known for a lot of aircraft uh, restoration and, and, and repair work. And his dad, uh, Gus, is in the background there. Uh, and so Mark was real instrumental in um, doing all the welding repair. And then, as you'll see in a little bit, he also helped with the overhaul of the engine that I got. Uh, he also introduced me to this thing called uh, MAAG, which is Mid-America Antique Airplane Group. Uh, it's part of the uh, antique airplane uh, group out of uh, Iowa. And so uh, that got us uh, involved in monthly uh, meetings where we would go around to different people's uh, homes on airports and, and have a meal and, and see airplanes and uh, help expose my wife to, to that lifestyle. So that, that was all good. So while I'm waiting to get the welding taken care of, I thought, well, I'll do a few other things. And so uh, I went to this place called Soft Strip in uh, Wichita where they uh, use uh, baking soda to basically blast the, the paint off of the airplane. And uh, I started trying to do it with paint remover and thought, well, this is going to take forever and it's going to be really expensive to buy a lot of paint remover. And so these guys, uh, that was like uh, after 30 minutes, they had the rudder and the horizontal uh, cleaned off there for me. But what we found was there was this crack that you can see uh, right here that uh, whoever had repaired it in the past just put a bunch of Bondo over it and called it good. You know, so you know, I think that's a good reason a lot of times to do a restoration because you can take it down to the bare bones, find out what you've really got, and make it right. And so uh, things were kind of going slow with Mark uh, and the welding. And so uh, here it is, uh, uh, February, March time frame. And, and I finally said, hey, uh, if I come over and, and I do the manual labor part, like cut out the old tube and grind out the welds and all that kind of stuff, uh, will that help speed things up? And he goes, oh, sure, that'd be great. Because, you know, he's really busy, lots of work. And so I took a day off uh, once a week uh, on a vacation, and I'd go up to a shop in Halstead, uh, Kansas, and uh, he'd show me, okay, today, you know, we're going to do this one. So I'd go in, and, and I'd cut the tubing, and then he showed me how to grind out welds. And I would get it mostly ground out, but then he would do kind of the finesse work at the end. And then he would weld in the new tube. And uh, this kind of shows you where we actually had to replace tubing. So you can see the uh, uh, lower uh, fuselage uh, longer ons, uh, basically almost the whole length were replaced. Some of the cross members were replaced. We also had uh, one of the tubes up here uh, was really kind of a gnarly looking weld, which I think was uh, somebody's repair when the airplane flipped over. And, uh, and so we replaced that one too. So everything looked really good. And so then I thought, well, <clears throat> you know, while this welding is going on, maybe I'll start working on the wings. And of course, you get the fabric off and you see all kinds of weird stuff like, you know, up in this uh, photo here, you know, there are a couple layers of metal there. Uh, you only need one, you know. So anyway, um, the guy who uh, had sold me the airplane uh, had a paint booth in his garage. And so he uh, epoxy primed the fuselage for me. So that was good. And, uh, you know, this is just another lesson you learn as you do these things is you, you don't trust uh, that what was done before is necessarily prototype design. So uh, this lower circle here is where the uh, pulleys for the flap and the aileron uh, are supposed to be. And so the second picture over there is the correct one. There's a double pulley there, two pulleys side by side. But when I took it apart, there was only one pulley and, and the flap actually was, in fact, you can see the cable here, was going up through that spacer uh, that was for the seat belt. And so somebody had used that as a pulley oh, and adjusted the cables appropriately. Yeah, so it's like, so, you know, I thought the digital camera would be one of the best things I had for putting this thing back together. But it turns out, while it's good, you got to realize that it, what you took apart may not have been right. And you can kind of see a before and after picture there. So uh, all cleaned up, no rust. And uh, Wade overhauled the, uh, the landing gear uh, struts before me, and we got those back on. Brandon, just a question. When you yeah. overhauled those, did you replace the springs, or how did you go about the tension and all that? Well, let me uh, ask the expert. Wade, what did we do? <laughs> So it was basically the seals. Uh, that yeah. Yeah. 
Good enough. Oh, so um, you know, those people. Uh, th this whole restoration was a journey of meeting people, and uh, Brad Sheldon uh, was the manager of the Great Lakes uh, factory uh, in Wichita back in the uh, mid '70s time period when they rebuilt the Great Lakes. Turned out he uh, went to my church, and and one time we were at a, a function and sitting next to each other, and and he asked me some question like, "Well, what do you do for fun?" You know, and I said, "Well." Let me tell you. you know, so I started talking about my restoration, and he got really excited about it. And then he started telling me about having helped Great Lakes uh, you know, get back in the air and, and all that kind of stuff. And so he uh, would continuously uh, come over and check on my progress and, and things like that. So uh, that was a, a good connection to make. Uh, so here you can see the few sludge coming together. I got my, my Westie sitting in there uh, waiting for a ride. Um, and then you know, it was interesting how others kind of stepped forward and said, hey, I hear you're restoring an airplane. Can I help you? And uh, my neighbor across the street, you know, he would come look in the garage from time to time and see what was going on. And he said, hey, if you ever need anything made, let me know. He says, it's got to be flat. But he, he owns this uh, company called Center Industries here in the Wichita area. He says, I can, I can make whatever you need. I said, OK. So I said, I need a new instrument panel. He goes, okay, well, give me a drawing or something. So I taped all this paper together on the dining room table and, and uh, started drawing you know, how I wanted to lay things out. And his engineers took that and they digitized it and then used their CNC router to cut out the panel that you see there. And so that turned out really nice. Uh, the other one is um, the wood up here. You can see on the right side there what it looked like. These are the things that are up on the wing root where the vent tubes uh, come through. And so uh, my friend Jim, who had helped me pick up those parts we talked about earlier, he, uh, he made those for me. So uh, We powder coated the um, instrument panel and the seats and, and several other things. And uh, I found this other guy, uh, Wes uh, Timmerman, who worked at Beechcraft at the time. And he says he had his own powder coating set up. He says, oh, yeah, bring me over you know, a couple, six packs of beer, and I'll powder coat anything you need. <laughs> I said, all right. <laughs> So I'm there, so so that was a pretty good deal. Um, yeah. <laughs> and then a friend of mine, his mom, uh, had reupholstered some of the seats uh, for the Bonanzas in the uh, Beach Flying Club. And so she had just retired, and I said, hey, will she do one more job? And he asked her, and she goes, okay, sure. So uh, she took my seats and reupholstered them and uh, put the Stinson logo on them and, and the whole whole business there. Uh, she did the side panels uh, as well that we'll see later on. Uh, during this whole process, we decided that uh, we should live on an airport, of all things. you know. And so we had bought a, a lot out at uh, Stearman Field, if you're familiar with that, here in uh, the, the Wichita area, and uh, had a house uh, going up. So there was a period there where no uh, airplane restoration work was going on, but it was going to be uh, in a better home soon. And so uh, that's uh, where we, we moved it in. Uh, this is August of 2010. And uh, as you can see, you know, the fuselage uh, is on the wheels and things are coming together. And I'm thinking, OK, you know, we're going to be done in another year or so, right? <laughs> so yeah. I actually, when I bought it in 2007, my target was Oshkosh 2010. And it uh, turned out it would be Oshkosh 2015 uh, that I would finally make. Um, so Mark uh, Weeby had uh, been over and he'd looked at my, my rudder and, and it had been repaired when it flipped over on its back. Uh, and he says, you know, you're not going to be very happy with those repairs uh, when you get everything else done. He said, why don't you order the parts from Univer and we'll make that right. And so, so that's what we did. You can see kind of the before and after there of the vertical tail and the, uh, and the rudder. Um, and of course, whenever you restore something and you spend, uh, you know, what was it, eight years doing it almost, a lot of things happen in life. And so um, both daughters ended up getting married, and, and one daughter had twins, and we finished the house. Uh, my dad passed away in that time period, so he uh, wouldn't see it uh, finished, but uh, you know, I did pick up a son-in-law in the process. And so 
Uh, there he is uh, being put to work. Uh, <laughs> and uh, he was uh, pretty good at painting, so uh, I took advantage of that uh, as we were uh, zinc or not, uh, epoxy priming uh, the, the wing and everything else we were doing. We made a, a little cradle there uh, so we could wheel the uh, wing around. And it's basically two salt courses with uh, two by fours connecting them and wheels on one end and, and a rope handle on the other. That worked really well. And, uh, and here we are uh, putting some of the last touches on the wing, including this thing I'd never heard of before called trammeling. And, uh, and Wade and I are there. And you're basically making sure the wing is square uh, when you're doing that. And so, uh, and adjusting the, the rods and all that to, to, to get to that point. And then uh, we started covering, so January 2012. And uh, Wade came over and showed me how to cover the aileron. And uh, we used the polyfiber process for this. And, um, and after we finished the aileron, he says, well, you know, why don't you try the other aileron on your own? So I did that. And, um, and at the same time, I was working other tasks, like you know, starting to populate the instrument panel uh, with uh, stuff and, and uh, cleaning out the fuel tanks because you know they had been sitting around for, for years. Uh, and here's some, some more help from, from friends. The other thing I found was uh, there was this guy who used to work for Beach, and he was in his 90s at the time. OK, 86, I guess. And he had been uh, a guy who would carve models uh, by hand. And usually they were for sales purposes. And uh, I went over to his apartment uh, with another friend from church. And, and the place was just, every square inch was covered with a model. And uh, it wasn't just airplanes, but it was ships and other things. And he happened to have a Stinson Voyager model. And so I bought that from him and, and painted it up with the paint design I'd been thinking about so I could see what it would look like in 3D. So, so that was pretty cool. And once we uh, you know, got the aileron covered, uh, Wade says, well, OK, a wing's nothing more than a big aileron. Here's a few pointers. Go ahead and have at it. I'll come over and check on you. And so uh, you can see in the upper corner here, we've got the, um, the padding that you put on the leading edge to help take out some of those imperfections. And uh, when we're, we're gluing the fabric on and then shrinking it up and then putting the poly uh, fill uh, onto, the, uh, onto the wing and uh, tapes. Uh, and uh, one thing that's nice about the Stinson is it uses the PK screws to hold the fabric down. So you don't have to worry about rib stitching and things like that. So that, that was a real time saver. So uh, covering the left wing, and then we did the right wing, same process. Um, I was making these interior panels at the time. And I found this stuff, I call it corrugated plastic. You know, it looks like corrugated cardboard, but it's made out of plastic. And you can get like an eight by, uh, four by eight sheet of it for like 10 bucks. So it's really cheap stuff. And I made all my side panels uh, out of that and then covered them with leather and, and, or whatever the, the medium was. Now, there's a, some other things you find along the way. This goes back to trust nobody again. Uh, one of the things Wade suggested was we needed to remove the little uh, filters that are in your wing tank. Uh, and they, they look like this picture up here. Uh, and so we took one side out, and it looked fine. And we took the other side out, and it was like the filter was too small. And it turned out that uh, you know it was a 3 h inch uh, line uh, or filter on that side uh, going to a half inch exit. And it really needed to be half inch on both sides because if you have the 165 horsepower engine, you have to have half inch lines. And so somewhere along the way, somebody had, had kludged up this uh, one that, you know, the airplane had half inch lines, but, uh, you know, the, the filter part in the tank was 3 eighths. And so, you know, I was putting a 180 horse engine on it, and you can imagine uh, how well that would have worked. Uh, so anyway, we ended up uh, welding a new piece into the tank there uh, to take care of that. But, you know, beware. Uh, so here's some more work on the fuselage. You know, side panels are finished. And uh, the other thing that Wade suggested was, hey, uh, go ahead and, and fit all your fairings and everything else to the airplane while there's no fabric on it. Because uh, then once you get it covered, it'll go a lot faster. So we did that. And, and then I started doing the wiring. And, and I thought that was actually one of the funner tasks. Along with covering, uh, wiring I thought was, was pretty fun. And uh, I have a, basically just a comm radio and a transponder, both Garmin. And uh, 
I now have EDSB out as well, so uh, we're ready to roll. And uh, power on, uh, this is uh, 2013 now. And there's a couple of really large gauge wires that I didn't have crimpers for. So uh, at the time I was working for Beechcraft, so I just took them in there and the guys in the shop you know, took care of it for me. So it's always good to have connections. Um, and so here's some of the last steps on the fuselage assembly. You know, I, I put uh, tube oil in the fuselage and, and then I tied the tail up to the hangar door and uh, let it drain. Uh, forward for a few days and then, then reverse that process. And uh, new boot cowl and, and uh, picture on the right there, uh, you know, weights checking uh, tensions on cables and things like that. And then we started doing the fuselage covering, uh, which was a little different than the wing, but uh, we did the, the bottom first and then we did the two sides and, uh, and then the top. Um, you know, it was really interesting. Uh, this stuff is supposed to shrink, right? And so you can see here was kind of what it looked like before I put the heat onto the uh, fabric. And then the picture on the right there is where it's all nice and tight. So you get that kind of interesting curvature uh, back there. And so uh, then of course you gotta start putting all the uh, reinforcing tapes and everything else on. Um, I had a little bug in my radios and a friend of mine, uh, Bill Latigo and his wife, or daughter, uh, Carrie, uh, came by, and uh, he's a uh, works for L3, and uh, he said, "Well, let me, you know, check your stuff out." And, and we kept everything was checking out. It's like, well, what's the deal here? Why doesn't it work? And then his daughter just said, "Well, do you have the the two plugs backwards?" And it's like, "Oh, we couldn't have done that, you know." But it turned out I had every headphone and 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 uh, mic jack backwards. Uh, so anyway, I was consistent at least. Uh, so then I thought, well, I'm going to paint this myself, so I better build a paint booth. And so I did that with uh, plastic and uh, PVC uh, tubing. Now, of course, being the cheap guy I am, I didn't buy thick enough uh, PVC piping that it would support itself. So I had to run a wire down through the center of the tube and then attach that to both ends of the hanger to hold the thing up. But in the end, uh, you know, I had a pretty decent box. It was big enough uh, to hold the fuselage. Uh, or the wings, but it couldn't do both at the same time. And so uh, here I am spraying on the poly brush and then the poly spray, uh, the silver coats. Uh, the picture on the right kind of shows, you know, you, you keep spraying until you don't see light coming through any longer. And then you know you've got enough on there. And then the uh, color coats uh, went on a poly tone and, uh, and the fuselage was, I thought, almost done. And so then I started painting the wings, kind of the same process. You put on the polyfill uh, and the poly spray and then the, the final paint. And, and then I started painting parts. Now, if you looked at the dates back here, you know, I uh, started spray coats in July of 2013. And here's August when I'm doing the wings. Now I'm starting to paint parts at September. I'm painting more parts in, in September. And, and even more painting in October. It's like, will this ever end? You know, it's kind of my thought, you know. But uh, finally in October it wrapped up. And so I was really happy and I could take the paint booth down. And then, you know, start doing the assembly. Uh, I always thought this uh, picture on the lower right was kind of interesting. You know, it was kind of my concept paint job and now you get to see it in, in reality. And, and a lot of friends came by to lend hands, uh, holding up wings and whatever. Yeah, but you know, there's a lot of little things you got to do. Uh, I ordered a new uh, plate uh, from Univer that uh, is the center um, attach point for the, the the rudder, and and things wouldn't fit. You know, it's like uh, when you have three attach points, you know, they all have to, to line up. And for some reason, when I put that on there, uh, you know, I couldn't get all three to work. And so we ended up. I took it to work and they shaved off 330 seconds off of this massive plate and, uh, and then it fit just fine. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I don't know what happened to the original one. Uh, maybe it was there when I took it apart. I couldn't remember at that point any longer, but uh, we got that fixed. All the lights are working. Here we are connecting uh, controls and uh, fuel lines. Now, the thing that's interesting about this is you'll notice that there's a, a piece of uh, rubber tubing on the horizontal tail. So we had we had put the tail up up on top of the toolbox uh, to level it, and and Wade's working away. He says, "Hey, could you go get me uh, like a half inch wrench or whatever it was?" I said, "Sure." You know, so I go back to the toolbox, 
grab the wrench, turn, take a step, and boom, you know, I uh, end up uh, cutting myself really good right here and uh, scratching up my glasses and everything else and uh, almost fell to the floor. It was close. And, uh, and maybe I did, I just don't remember. But anyway, um, just when you're doing this kind of stuff, think about safety and, and, and put things like this on before and not after, you know, so. Uh, so here's some work on the interior, and uh, I really worried about putting a headliner in myself, and I thought this is going to be a real challenge. But you know, it turned out to be a lot easier than I thought. The only thing I would do different is put it in before you cover the airplane. You know, but uh, it is possible to do it afterwards. And some more interior shots. Uh, you can see the side panels that uh, uh, Gene made uh, coming together there. And um, I decided uh, that. I was putting the 180 horse like homing engine in, so there was no way I'd ever win any awards like at Oshkosh or whatever. And so I thought, well, I might as well just go full full bore here. So I decided to change the end number as well. So I changed it to 678RD, uh, the R for Randy, the D for Debbie. Uh, I was going to flip that around, but that number was already taken by a bonanza somewhere. Uh, I bought an engine, uh, and it's in pieces here. Uh, Mark uh, knew a guy up in Canada that uh, he traded things with, and he says, oh, he's got 180 horse like combing if you're interested. And I said, sure. So, so I bought that. Uh, here you can see the uh, kit for the conversion, and uh, you get a lot of parts for your money, though it's not cheap. Uh, this new uh, engine mount, uh, you get a new spinner. Uh, the exhaust system comes with it, uh, baffling, uh, all the hoses and stuff. Uh, you know, so it's a pretty complete kit that you get from Univer for the uh, conversion and, and drawings and everything else to go with that. Um, the guy in the upper left is uh, Bruce Plindle. He's a member of our, our club. He lives out in the Seattle area. And uh, I actually taught him how to fly a Stinson back in the uh, early 90s. And so I was out there on vacation uh, visiting my daughter who lives out there. And, and so he... Uh, let me go fly his so I could kind of get current again in Stinson's. Uh, but you can see some other parts kind of coming together. And, and I'm doing more painting at this point because I bought the fairings and everything else for the wing and, and stuff from Univer. Um, getting the brake system in. Here you can see the mod that happens to the cowling. Uh, this hole becomes bigger and there's a reinforcement plate that goes on there. And then there's a kind of a fairing that goes on the top here for uh, the uh, big gear that's part of the, uh, uh, the engine. So got those going. Uh, there's some modification to the lower cowl that has to happen as well for the conversion. Putting in the windshields here as well. And then I came home one day and there was a great big dent in my lower cowling. It's like, what happened, you know? And, and we have earthquakes around here sometimes from, uh, they blame it on the fracking down in Oklahoma and whatever. And uh, this, this bookcase had kind of fallen over on top of the cowling. And, and that's what I blame. I'm not sure how it would have happened otherwise. But uh, anyway, uh, Mark uh, Wiebe saved the day with his hammer and hammered it back out for me. It's, and it's pretty amazing when you look at it. You'd never know that, that happened. So here's some of the last things going on before we get the engine installed, uh, putting the ELT in, that kind of stuff and then uh, the overhaul of the engine. So I took a couple of days off and went up to Mark's place as he overhauled the engine for me and I uh, got to see all that come together. I uh, got the engine installed in April uh, of 2015 and uh, this lower picture, you can tell it's running because the propeller is a little bit blurry. Uh, so, so there's running. And then we, we weighed it. A lot of people ask me, you know, what does this thing weigh with a Lycoming in it? And so it's uh, 1312 is, uh, is the weight. And then finally, a uh, first flight on June 5th of 2015. And so, uh, you know, I started December 2007 and first flight June 2015. So you can see it's about seven and a half years. Not continuous uh, effort, but uh, I think if you take out the time when I was waiting on people or parts or whatever, it could probably be done in like five years uh, easily. And so anytime you do something like this, you, you learn some lessons. And so I want to pass those on to you guys. Uh, one, always make sure you keep your wife's car in the garage. You know, so you know, we had a three car garage uh, when I first started this. So I cleared off two spaces and that was my restoration area. 
but her car was always in the garage. And so I scraped windows on my own car for a long time there. Make sure you wear protective gear, you know, so you're working with polyfiber stuff, that's MEK based, you know, wear a respirator, wear the proper gloves, uh, you know, put the foam on the back, the tail before you bang your head into it, you know, do all those kinds of things. And um, as I mentioned earlier, I thought I would be at Oshkosh in 2010 and it turned out to be 2015. So it's gonna take you a lot longer than you can imagine. And, and you're gonna spend a lot more than you ever thought. I spent, including buying the airplane, the engine, all the fabric, the instruments, radios, um, the conversion kit for the like homing, finding a like homing, uh, $99,000 when I was done. So it's, you know, but I have a brand new airplane, you know, because everything, you know, every nut, bolt, pulley, cable, wire, fabric, engine, instrument, radio, it's all been replaced. And so, you know, you can go to, I think it's Yingling here in Wichita and they remanufacture Cessnas like 172s, and they're over 100,000, like 115 or 120, I think. And so, you know, that's kind of what, what I did. So if you don't want to spend $99,000, you know, go find the nicest ensign you can and just pay the guy whatever he's asking, and you'll come out money ahead. However, if you want to learn a lot and you want to meet a, really, uh, a lot of really neat people along the way, and you really want to know your airplane, then there's not a better way to do it than to, to do it yourself. And so uh, I always uh, like to thank people. And of course, you know, my wife was uh, key, and I wouldn't have got there without Wade, so thanks, Wade. Uh, Mark Weeby played a big role, and uh, you know, Arv Crummins, uh, he was a guy I worked with at Beach, and, and he actually, uh, on his own hours, you know, went and, and in the computer laid out this really nice wiring diagram for me so I knew exactly what went where. And uh, Nathan Herter, that's my son-in-law, so uh, got a lot, of, a lot of good out of him. And then uh, my friend Jerry let me use his trailer to haul the fuselage around and, and all that kind of stuff. So uh, here's a few pictures of Oshkosh 2015. And what's interesting is the guy in the very center there is Jim Folsom. Now, if you remember the name earlier, I talked about Al Folsom. Al was his dad. And his first flight in this airplane was when he was like three weeks old in his mom's arms. He is now a uh, 777 uh, captain for United. So, you know, th good things happen when you, you grow up in a Stinson, I guess. And so, and some of the other folks that we saw at Oshkosh, and my, my younger daughter is up there in the upper right. You know, we, uh, we spent five or six hours getting to Oshkosh by Stinson, and she spent like an hour getting there in a biz jet. So, yeah, definitely ways to go. And so, you know, I kind of, asked the question early on, you know, why is Stinson? And so here's some kind of comparative pictures from 75 to 2015. And uh, the uh, lower left is uh, my dad and I, and then my lower right is me and my daughter. So. so then it was like, well, that was so much fun. Let's do it again. So now you'll notice there's a couple of years in between here. And I almost thought, you know, I. You know, I'm always looking at Barnstormer, like I mentioned, and so I found this V77 for sale on Barnstormers, and it was like uh, in October of 2017, and I called the guy, and I looked it up in the NTSB database, and it had been in an accident and all this other stuff, so I thought, okay, you know, do I really want this? And I finally called him back and said, ah, I don't think I'm interested. And then my uh, wife and I were talking over Thanksgiving, and, and she convinced me it was the right thing to do. <laughs> so, <laughs> so so we did, so we got it. And, uh, and that's kind of what it looks like even to today. Uh, so the, uh, the upper picture was back in its prime uh, when it was living in Phoenix. And uh, I picked it up, it was in Florida. It had gone through Minnesota, I think. Uh, Randy was telling me as well. And so, uh, you know, these are just some pictures of us uh, picking it up and, and loading it into the biggest U-Haul you can buy uh, or rent. And it all fit just barely and it was kind of a tough thing getting it all in there but uh, we made it and got it home and so everybody always says well what's the uh, reasons you're restoring a v77 now and so of course I had to put together the top 10 list uh, for that being a list kind of guy that I am so uh, in case you can't see them, I'll read a few of these so it's another chance to help preserve uh, an airplane so that's always good 
And by starting with the bare bones and doing quite a bit of the work myself, uh, I'm going to know what I got when I'm finished. And when you show up at an air show, uh, you can be really proud of it. Uh, like the 108, it's a metal uh, structure, and, and it's built like a tank. And there's no 80s on that airplane either. And so it's got a round engine, so you can't beat the sound of a round engine, right? Uh, you get great parking at Oshkosh, and that's always good. Well, I skipped the uh, room for five to travel in comfort uh, like an old Packard. Uh, I've always had a soft spot uh, for uh, a gall wing. I had seen one back when I was a kid and just fell in love with the look. And so when I built my hangar, I sized it big enough to hold a gall wing just in right. case. <laughs> And of course, number two, I can't afford a stagger wing, so the next best thing is a gall wing. And, and finally, the, the last reason is the most important reason. My, my wife said, okay. So, right. <laughs> so uh, maybe 2023, uh, time will tell. Uh, this is one that Rare Aircraft restored, and I kind of like the, uh, the look of it. Uh, I'm going to go black and gold, though, instead of uh, blue here. So we'll see how that turns out. So I think that's my story. Oops, wrong way. Oh, yeah, so um, I kept track of everything I did with pictures and words, and, and I have a blog site that uh, you can go to today if you want, and uh, you can see the restoration from start to finish, and uh, you can read about all the fun I've had uh, since flying it around. And, of course, now with the V-77, I'm chronicling that uh, story as well. And, and so I pulled off a few stats about it yesterday, uh, I've posted 869 posts so far, so if you have insomnia some night, this will take care of that. Um, over 50,000 views, so you know a lot of people kind of looking around. And what's interesting is uh, this is the views per month. And so you can see this peak way up here, almost 1,600. That was right around first flight, so people were checking all the time, okay, has he flown, has he flown? And then uh, you can also see various places people are keeping track of me from. And some of these, I have no clue how they even know about it. But you know, that's the beauty of the internet, I guess. Uh, so I got people in the Ukraine uh, looking at it, and uh, Russia, Germany, uh, various countries. Of course, the United States is the, the big winner there. So. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Well, you know, if it was North Korea, I'd really worry, but, you know. Now, uh, I brought some, uh, I'll call them business cards today. And on one side, it's got a picture of the Voyager. And then on the other side, it's got a picture of what I think the V-77 will look like someday. It's got my contact information, and it's got my blog site uh, uh, address as well. So I'll hand these out to everybody. Feel free to, to go in there and, and drive that 50,000 views up to, like, 60,000 or whatever. And... Uh, as you go through it, if you have questions, uh, like if you're doing a restoration or something and, and you know you want to know how we did something, if you don't see it on the blog, just send me an email, and I'd be happy to, to give you input. So that's all I got. Questions? Yeah.